All right, so we're, we're, uh, this is our um, <coughs> series we're in the middle of. We've started in Advent, and we're working all the way through Easter. We're going through the entire Gospel of Luke. And uh, we have a reading schedule. Uh, today we are in Luke 21, in the first half of this week, excuse me, this week that we're coming into. We're in Luke chapter 21, and the first half of uh, chapter 22. And so we're moving along here, and Easter's not too far away now. Uh, where we are in the life of Jesus, he has been spent most of his ministry kind of moving up all around here. And, and, you know, we have little snippets of that. In the beginning, we said before, in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, we have an awful lot about uh, the way Jesus worked. And he's picking his disciples and he's sending out the 12 and he's sending out the 72 and things like that. And then, but after a while, you, you, can, you can only say, and he went to a town and did this and that so many times because he's doing the same thing over and over. So as you move through the Gospel of Luke, you tend to start to get more and more of what he's, the different kind of things he's teaching as opposed to what he's doing, because he's kind of got a life that uh, is fairly patterned in some ways. And so he, he, he's uh, all over here, and then he heads down to Jerusalem, he goes through Samaria and stuff like that. Then he gets down into Jerusalem, and then um, in Luke chapter 19, a couple chapters ago, we have the triumphal entry where he rode into uh, Jerusalem uh, on a donkey as uh, sort of a triumphal king, which is a very provocative act. We're going to talk about that on, uh, on Palm Sunday and some other things about how provocative Jesus really was on Palm Sunday. Uh, and now we're going to see Jesus has this pattern of teaching in the outer court of the temple every day, and then he goes uh, out of Jerusalem at night. And our text for today... We're going to do something. We're going to try and go through the entire uh, 21st chapter of Luke because it kind of all goes together. So the first thing we saw, I uh, already read the first four verses, was the widow's offering. And, and we were reminded there of what we were reminded all throughout Scripture. It is the heart turned toward God, the heart drawn back to God that is the thing that God desires because he wants us to be filled with joy and peace, and we are filled with joy and peace as we hear his call to repentance and turn back to him to, to live this life of grace, uh, showered in God's love. And it's, it's not about the outward cer ceremonies, it's about the heart. And so the ceremonies that help us, we want to keep those ceremonies, and the ceremonies that don't help us, we either want to learn to let them help us or get rid of them. But the point is not the ceremony. Uh, and so we have this widow who brought in almost nothing, and yet God says, there that is. We have the same thing when, um, when, uh, when God was choosing a king for Israel after Saul fell. You know, they looked at all these kids, and they were all like, looked kingly, and God told the prophet that he looks at the heart, not the outward appearance. And so that's always been the case. It's always been the case that God is not after some show of outward piety. Of course, those, that's part, you know, your, your faith is visible, but trying to make your faith visible, that outward gesture has to grow out of the heart. It's not something we manufacture. So it's the heart. And, and Jesus said, it's in the temple, he says, look, see, that, see those people putting that? She put in more than anything because it came out of her heart. She really gave generously because... Uh, um, because her, her, her heart is in the right place toward God. And by the way, the, the temple didn't use the money very well a lot of times. And so Jesus wasn't even talking about the way the earthly temple would be using the funds that she gave. He was just talking about her relationship with God. So we have the widow's offering. Uh, that life, it, um, life with God is a life that comes from the heart. And now we get, that's the first thing. And now, now the next thing happens, uh, beginning at Luke and Jesus is going to start saying some things that sound, uh, that he's going to be talking about what's going to be happening. And he's going to be telling us some things that are going to be happening. And, and it's, there's going to be a lot of violence and stuff uh, in these readings. But as we go through these readings, what we're going to find is, uh, is that I think Jesus, it starts with this woman who's, who, 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 whose heart is in the right place. And then it goes through all this stuff. And then he's going to kind of round that whole thing back out by talking about the heart again. And so we're going to walk through this uh, at a pretty rapid clip uh, in the beginning here. And, and kind of see how all this ties into the heart. So the next thing Jesus is going to do in verse 5, uh, he's going to talk about the destruction of the temple. 
While some were speaking of the temple and how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, Jesus said, As for these things you see, the days will come when there will not be one stone left upon another here. They will all be thrown down. And they said, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will be a sign that these things are about to take place? And Jesus said, See that you are not led astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand, but do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, don't be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. So, things are going to get bad, the, even, even the temple is going to get destroyed, but that's not the end of time. The next thing Jesus does, he continues to talk about wars and persecution and death, and I'm sorry that that's so low. That you can't see it behind the altar. Maybe you can do a wave, and then you can all see it one at a time. <laughs> a quick look. <clears throat> Luke chapter 21, verse, beginning verse 10 now. Jesus said, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom will be against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places, and famine, and pestilence, and there will be terrors, and great signs in the heaven. But before all this, before all the other stuff that Jesus is talking about, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you and deliver you up to the synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds not to think beforehand about how to answer because I will give you a mouth and a wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Now in that part, there's this interesting little thing going on right there. He says, some of you will be put to death. And then he says, but not a hair of your head will perish. How, does the, how do those two go together? Jesus must be talking about something bigger. Something bigger than our life on earth. The next thing he's going to talk about is the destruction of the whole city of Jerusalem. And this is more current. He says, uh, beginning of verse 20 now, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains, and those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country come into the city, for these days of vengeance will fulfill what is written about Jerusalem. Alas, for women who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days, there will be great distress in the earth and wrath against this people. who will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. Until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Jerusalem fell and the temple was raised in 70 AD. Interestingly, in a very unusual historical incident, the nation of Israel, wiped out for 2,000 years, was reformed in 1948. We're not going to go there, it's just, it's interesting. The, the nation of Israel had been scattered for two millennia, and then all of a sudden, it's a nation again. That might be telling us something about the times we're living in. The next one, Jesus will tell us about his final coming. Beginning of verse 25, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. And people will be fainting with fear and foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud of power and great glory. So now, when these things begin to take place, raise up your head. Because your redemption is drawing near. And then he gives another parable. Jesus loves to give parables. And he talks about a fig tree. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaves, you see for yourselves. And you know summer is near. So, just like the tree, 
When you see these things taking place, know that the kingdom of God is near. For truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So, a lot of bad stuff is going to happen. Things are going to get horrible. For the Jewish nation, they did get horrible. The rebellion occurred. The Romans, who were not interested in coddling rebellious people, came in and razed the place in 70 AD. And now we're in the time of the Gentiles. And Jesus says that before his return, things are going to get very bad. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be uh, things happening with the earth, earthquakes and floods and, and roaring waves of the sea. But when that happens... He's telling us to take courage and look up because that actually means that his coming is close. And the last part is where he gets to our hearts again. He started out with the heart of this woman who was in the right place. And now he gets back to our hearts after telling us all this stuff. And that's the center. He says, in this beginning in verse 34 of Luke 21, which you'll read this week if you are reading along. Watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and that they come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the whole earth. So stay awake at all times and pray that you have the strength to escape these things that are coming and to stand when the Son of Man returns. And every day Jesus was teaching this in the temple. But at night he went out and lodged on the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning the people came to him in the temple to hear him preach and teach again. And so we have this, it starts out with the idea that it, this, this widow gave all she had her hearts in the right place. And he, and he goes through all these other things about all this stuff that's going to happen in the world. And it's big stuff, and we all have little stuff happen in the world, too. We have stuff happen in our own world. And Jesus says, take care that your hearts don't get weighed down. Weighed down with, he says, too many papers today, weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness. Now, that's very interesting, because dissipation basically means drunkenness. And I don't know what it's, it's... So it must be emphasizing something about the escapism of drunkenness. Because people do drink and do drugs to escape. Not everybody drinks to escape. It's a glass of wine in the evening is nice. But there are people who work for the weekend, and then they get blasted. And that's the only time they're really happy. And they're, they're escaping from their life. They're, they're weighed down, and that's their escape. And then the other part is the one that I think probably hits more of us sometimes, getting weighed down with the cares of this life. See, all this thing is going to happen, all this stuff's going to happen, and it all can all weigh us down. We read in the psalm today of all the different things that can happen that can, that can all weigh us down. It can weigh our hearts down with the cares of this life. And so Jesus is warning us and he's telling us all these horrible things that are going to happen. And it's not to scare us, but to encourage us to not be weighed down in the middle of all this stuff. He's not telling us that we can be afraid. In fact, more than once he says, don't be afraid. Don't be terrified. He says, settle in your minds not to worry ahead of time what you're going to say when people you know, confront you about me. The whole thing is there so that as these things will happen, you and I will not be afraid. And that's where I want to just spend the last little bit here about the idea of living the faith in Jesus that enables us to live and not be afraid. Because the idea of living, living our lives uh, and not not being weighed down by the fear and the cares of this life. That's what's going to bring us joy. When we, that's, faith is trusting God with our lives, and when we can trust God no matter what's happening, that's when we're going to have joy in every moment. What we, Jesus really is giving us to, giving to us part of all this stuff, as crazy as it sounds, 
He's giving us an invitation to joy. He's giving us an invitation to joy, to not be concerned about all this stuff. Yes, it's going to happen, but don't let that get to you. Don't let that weigh you down because your salvation is near, he said. We read it. Your salvation is near. So this is an invitation to joy in the present. To not be, to not be attached to this world. Now, a lot of, a lot of different uh, religious uh, teachings and traditions talk about attachment as, as kind of uh, the thing that robs us of joy. Because, you know, a lot of religious teachings, they, they, the, these teachers are great people who are seeking truths in life and they're observing. Uh, for instance, Buddhism talks about attachment as the source of suffering. And so they want to detach from everything. But their idea of detachment is very different than what the scriptures tell us about the detachment from stuff that, um, that Christ teaches us to have. The detachment of Buddhism is because all is going to come to nothing, right? It's, 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 all a, it's all a mist and there's nothing there, so there's nothing to be attached to. So let it all go and don't be attached to anything. If it, it is exactly the opposite. The, 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 the non-attachment that Christ teaches. It's, it's, it's don't be attached to things simply so they don't rob you of your joy. So you are free to love. The Bible says Jesus was in his very nature God, but he didn't count that something to be clung to. And he came to the earth, taking on the form of a servant, and being found in that likeness, became obedient unto death, even death on a cross for our sake. And so the, the attachment, the, the, the not being attached to the things of this world is not, is not in that Buddhist way of like, because there's nothing out there, but it, it's because we want to be free to love. Just like Christ was not attached to heaven, all the things that we get attached to, how much more would heaven be something to get attached to? And yet Christ was not attached to that. He let it go to come down here for our sakes, for love. And so when we have things around us, we need to learn as followers of Christ to receive with joy, but not to claim the attachment. I think that's what Jesus would teach us. Receive with joy, but don't cling with attachment. One of my favorite authors, uh, uh, Brene Brown, she studies, uh, she actually studies uh, shame. She's a shame researcher. Uh, but one of the things she has noticed in all her research, and, and you've all felt this before, is there is this, there is this uh, thing that happens or can happen when there's something that we find great joy in is that our our fear of losing that our fear of the possibility of losing the thing of great joy sweeps in to steal the joy that we have right now how many people have looked at their children with great joy and within one second all of a sudden, you're aware of how you would be torn up if you lost them. That is a common parental feeling. She calls that foreboding joy. And what that is, is that's, that's your idea of the future, which, by the way, you don't actually know, sweeping in to steal the joy of the present. And Jesus gives us a gift when he does this. He says, listen, stuff is going to happen, but don't let that steal the joy of the present. Trust that stuff to God. Embrace the joy, embrace the present, and leave the future to God. Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. Who of you, by worrying, can add an hour to your life? And, you know, now we know that you can actually cut your life shorter by worrying. So, um, the thing Jesus is teaching us with all of us is to embrace today's joy and leave the future to God. That's what he said. Don't think, settle in your minds to not think beforehand about how to answer because I will take care of that in the instance we're talking about here. And so we embrace today's joy and that enables us to love without fear because we are trusting the future to God and we can put ourselves out there in love. 
and not be weighed down by all the other stuff. And so I think really one of the things I would like to give you today is the encouragement because of your trust in Jesus Christ that your life is in his hands. That's what he says. When all this stuff happens, don't fret. In fact, look up because it actually means your redemption is near because you are safe in his hands. And so today, practice leaving the future in God's hands. That's what I would say. Today, practice leaving the future in God's hands. Find things, open your eyes, open your ears, open your sense of touch and your smell to things that bring joy today and just embrace them today without any thought for tomorrow or the next day or the day after that. Embrace the things today. Embrace the joys today that God gives you today. Big things, little things. The beautiful weather. Ah, it's going to rain tomorrow. You know, what a beautiful spring. Yeah, but summer's coming. How about just, yeah, it is a beautiful day. Let's do something and not worry about what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. When you, that's the practice for today. When, when a joy comes, just take the joy for what it is. And not thinking about what's going to happen in the next day. When someone you love smiles at you, just take it. And just say, wow, that is a gift. It's a gift to have someone you love smile at you. It's a beautiful thing. If you see a tree, look at the tree and say, wow, that's a gift to me, to see that beautiful tree. Some people really love trees. Maybe it's the breeze on your face. Maybe it's washing your hands. Have you ever washed your hands and thought, wow, that really just feels good? That feels good to wash your hands. Or maybe... You got your hands dirty and you said, that feels good to get my hands dirty. Some people, any gardeners out there? The point, the time you like is getting your hands into the soil, you know, not the washing of your hands. So, 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 so take that for today for what it is. It's a gift. That pleasure is a gift to be absorbed and taken into you because, because Jesus has all this other stuff under control. He's trying to tell us this is happening. It's going to happen. Whatever. Do not worry. Do not worry about that stuff. It's in his hands. Maybe you hear a song you love. Maybe you smell flowers. Maybe you get a hug from someone. Just take that moment of joy as it is. Without thinking of what happened before. Without thinking of what might happen in the future. Just embrace the moment of joy. I think that's our lesson for today. To embrace the moment and leave all the other stuff in the hands of Christ. When we learn to do that, we're going to grow in our ability to live out the mission of our lives as Christians. We're going to grow in our ability to live in faith because we start operating in the moment, trusting the future to God. We're going to grow in our ability to operate in hope, again, because we have trusted the future to God. And we're going to grow in our ability to love because our emotions are right here. Our love is right here and right now. It's not partly here and partly off in the future. It's not partly here and partly in the past. The past is gone. It's taken away. Whatever happened, Christ has taken the cross. The future is not yet. And it's all in Jesus' hands. What we have is now. And when we learn to live now, as Jesus said, we will be able to live out more fully the life of faith, hope, and love that God has called us to as his mission for his people in the world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have given us uh, great news today. I, I know that seems strange because we've all heard an awful lot about wars and, 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 uh, and persecutions and even like betrayal from family members and, and all sorts of stuff. But the under, undertone of it all is to keep our hearts focused on you in our lives and to receive the gifts of joy that you give us in each day. So open our eyes, Father. Open our eyes to, to all the little joys that you're putting in our path. And give us hearts that trust tomorrow to you so that when those joys come, we can live with them in the moment, filled with thanks to you 
for all you've done for us. Enable us to just go out today and receive your gifts of joy. In Jesus' name.